Father in heaven, please guide our minds this afternoon that we may truly understand your will for us and how we can live lives that will be pleasing in your sight. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. A general conference president said a while back, this question lies at the root of most denominational tensions. What question, in his opinion, lies at the root of most of our denominational tensions? His question is, what shall we do with Ellen White? What shall we do with Ellen White? And that is, I believe, <clears throat> one of the biggest issues today in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Let me give you a few statistics that I wish I didn't have to give you, but they are real. This is in the Adventist Review. In North America, we have about a 17% reader population for the Spirit of Prophecy books. Did you hear I said North America? Not Africa, not South America, not Hungary, not Romania. In North America, we have a 17% reader population for the Spirit of Prophecy books, meaning people who are reading the Spirit of Prophecy books with all of the books that we have. And most of those readers are over the age of 65. That's a statistic that ought to be a little bit alarming. 17% read them, and most of them are over 65. It's not that we don't have access to Ellen White books. We're just choosing not to read them. If new members are not oriented as to why we're Seventh-day Adventists and what motivates us as a church, if they don't understand the great controversy theme, if they don't see the emphasis that God has given us through the writings of Ellen White, then we're going to have a lot of people who don't totally understand why they're Seventh-day Adventists and who may not be fully prepared to stand true to God in these last days. If there are any books that have the possibility of preparing us to stand through what is coming ahead, I'm going to suggest it's the Spirit of Prophecy books. In fact, I'm going to say this. This is the most important subject I talk about in all of the topics that I speak about. And I have about 80 presentations that I give on different topics. This is the most important presentation that I give because I believe that a clear understanding of this subject will make it possible for you to survive what's coming upon this earth. And I believe to the contrary, those who do not have a clear understanding of this subject will not survive what's coming on this earth. That's how important I believe this subject is. I believe this is a make or break subject for survival in the end times. And that's why I present it and why we're going to talk about it this afternoon. All right, now let's talk about something else for just a minute here. If you were to visit any seminary type library where ministers are being trained, you would find one whole shelf of books, not a book or two, but a whole shelf of books on one subject, the search for the historical Jesus. Now that sounds like a great subject, the search for the historical Jesus. Why so many books on that subject? All right, here's how it works. Our scholarly friends, and we're talking about across all denominations, our scholarly friends are telling us that when you take this Bible and you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the stories of Jesus Christ, what he taught, uh, what he, the miracles he did, that some of those stories and miracles and teachings were not written actually by Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. But they were added later in the second and third centuries by Christians who wanted to flesh out the story of Jesus a little bit. They'd heard a legend about Jesus of what he said, what he did. They put it in the scriptures. And so that's part of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these scholars, their sometimes life work is to help you and me understand which parts of the Gospels are authentic stories of Jesus and which parts are legendary and untrue stories about Jesus. 
That's their job as they see it. So they're going to take your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they are going to suggest to you which parts you can trust and believe in and which parts can be set aside as irrelevant, legendary, and therefore untrue about Jesus Christ. To help you understand the search for the historical, the real Jesus. Not the Christ that was added in by later writers and then claimed to be from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Now, to give you an example of how this works, a group called the Jesus Seminar meets a couple of times a year. Today, right now. And uh, they uh, meet together and present papers, scholarly papers, on exactly what we're talking about here. Which parts are authentic, which parts are not authentic. And they tried an, a little experiment one time. They said, let's just see for the fun of it if we can get unanimous agreement, not 50%, not 70%, but unanimous agreement on which parts of the Gospels are authentic and which are not. Just for fun. Let's try it. So they took the Gospel of Mark, which is the shortest one, and they said, now they, I don't know how they did this, chapter by chapter or whatever, but they, they went down the line and said, now how many of you agree that this is an authentic story of Jesus? How many of you agree that this is an authentic miracle of Jesus, a teaching of Jesus? They got unanimous agreement on one sentence in the book of Mark as being authentic. Unanimous agreement. They tried the book of John. They got zero sentences in the book of John that they could all agree on. So you see, what is really happening here is these scholars with the best intentions in the world are telling you which parts of this Bible you can accept as real and which parts of the Bible you can set aside as irrelevant. And they're not very clear on how many, what their unanimous agreement is on the Gospels of John, Mark, etc. as to which are authentic and which are not. And uh, I'm going to just ask you a simple question. Do you think that's helped us? Is that helpful to understand the Bible? You see, the problem is, once you go down that road, who becomes the final authority? Me. My mind, my scholarly approach, my approach how, I, how I make decisions. You see, you're going to have to make a decision. The key word that we're going to be focusing on this afternoon is the word authority. Does this book have final authority over your life? That's the question. In other words, very simply, when you're addressing a subject, what is the proper thing that I should do regarding? And you're debating it. And you're trying to figure out what God's will is. If God says specifically in this book what his will is, do you end your discussion right there? Or do you say, well, but, you know, there are other factors here. Times have changed. Uh, things are different now than they were when Moses was writing or John or someone else. Uh, the things aren't quite the same. You don't have to worry about that anymore. If you do that, who's the final authority? Your mind. So you have one or other of the final authority. This book will be your final authority or your mind will be your final authority. One or the other. You can't have both. Uh, just to say, as the simplest of all possible examples, when God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and you're convicted that's what God is telling you, can you then say, but I like Tuesday better. But I think Sunday might work too. Everybody else goes to church on Sunday. Well, why not? Is the Bible your final authority? Does discussion cease when God says clearly in this book? That's the issue. Or does discussion continue after God has clearly spoken? Then you become the final authority. Always the word authority in this case. And by the way, when you're discussing parts of the Bible that are not regarded as authoritative, what six chapters of the Bible have been almost universally thrown out by most Christians? What six chapters of the Bible? How about the first ones? The first six chapters of the Bible 
How many Christians really truly believe in a seven day creation a short time ago? Most Christians believe in theistic evolution because science seems to say that's the only way it could happen. It couldn't have happened approximately 6,000 years ago. It couldn't have happened on six literal days. Final authority. Once again, where does it reside? Within the mind or in God's word? Now, I'm going to share something with you that I think is interesting. This is from a congregational pastor in Kansas. And uh, here's his letter that came into Ministry Magazine. God lies beyond our understanding and calls us to trust his spirit to lead us beyond the place that we can see clearly. Whether I accept Daniel as the product of inspiration in the 7th century or inspiration in the 2nd century doesn't really matter. Now the background to that is many scholars today don't believe that Daniel actually wrote the book of Daniel, but that someone in the 2nd century used the name of Daniel and wrote the book of Daniel. So he's responding to that. Whether I accept Daniel as a 7th century writer or a 2nd century writer doesn't really make any difference. So I ask the question, does it make a difference? Whether Daniel wrote in the 7th century or the 2nd century. Let's pretend he wrote in the 2nd century. What does that mean for all of his marvelous prophecies? It's history, not prophecy. The great nations have come up. Babylon has fallen. Medo-Persia has taken its place. Greece has come up. Rome is now the major power. And he's pretending to write prophecy when it's really history. So, does it make a difference? Whether I accept Esther, the book of Esther is not really accepted by most Christian scholars as authentic, by the way. Whether I accept Esther as history, legend, or folktale doesn't really matter. Well, once again, does it or doesn't it? Uh, and then this amazing statement, this is his conclusion. The Bible is the sole authority for faith and practice not because it is factual or even because it is true but because God has spoken through it to us and still does so by his spirit I would be pleased if you would interpret that statement for me the Bible is the sole authority for faith and practice not because it is factual or even because it is true but God has spoken to us well what has he spoken I have no idea if all of these things are fables and stories and made up things. What has he spoken? And how is it my authority? How, if, if, if it's all made up? So that, that one boggled my mind as I came across that letter. And uh, I don't even know how to go any farther with that. All right. As I say, that was our little side trip. And you'll see how it pertains to our subject. The Bible, is it your authority as God has written it, as we have it in this collection of 66 books? Or can we pick and choose what we would like, which seems to make more sense to us? Now, would you take the outline that you've been given? The rest of our time will be in the, on the pages of this outline. And I'm not going to give references because you have them all printed right here in front of you. So you know what the refer where the references are. I'll just let you know where we are at each point. And by the way, one little thing about evaluating Ellen White. When you evaluate me or your pastor, here is what you can say. Well, I liked 50% of what Preby said, but the rest of it is garbage and I'm throwing it in the trash can. Yeah, you can say that. Because I have no authority over your salvation. I have zero authority. I can suggest things to you, I can share what I've learned, but I am not your judge, and you will not be saved or lost because of what I say. You're going to have to decide for yourself. And so a pastor or a teacher does not have any authority from God. All a pastor or a teacher does is say, I have read this book, and this is how I understand it. Can you say exactly the same thing? I have read this book, and this is how I understand it. All pastors and teachers have done is taken a little more classwork. That's all. Uh, we have no more ability to understand the Word of God than you do. 
We have no more, uh, no more uh, closeness to God and understanding His will than you do. You have this book. You have to evaluate this, any speaker, on the basis of this book. And you can say 50-50. I have books in my library that are like that. I like part of it. The rest is garbage and I won't spend any time on. But the, I bought the book because it had some good stuff that I could use. Okay. Can you evaluate a prophet like that? Can you evaluate Jeremiah like that? I like 50% of what Jeremiah said, the rest is out. Isn't that what they tried to do, by the way, with Jeremiah? They kind of liked what he had to say about relationship to God, but when he said, God's will is for you to surrender to the Babylonians right now, and don't fight any longer, don't try to maintain your independence, you just surrender, and you recognize that that's God's punishment on you for your apostasy. Wow, they didn't like that at all. And you know the whole story. I mean, he was put in a pit and would have died there if somebody hadn't taken pity on him. Uh, that was treason. So they were picking and choosing which parts of Jeremiah they liked and would abide by and which parts they would throw out. Why is that illegitimate for a prophet? Very simple. Because a prophet doesn't interpret the word of God like I do. A prophet gives the word of God. And what if a prophet is giving 70% of God's word and 30% of his own word? How can you tell the difference? How can you sort it out? How do you know which is which? Will we follow our scholarly friends and say, well, we'll sort it out by your guidelines. We'll take your guidelines as to which we accept and which we reject. No, a prophet, here's the, what, as I say, a prophet's mission, a prophet's, a prophet's standard is different than a pastor or a teacher. Either a prophet is speaking 100% for God or zero for God because God won't have half and half. A prophet carries authority. I don't carry authority. I share, but I have no authority. A prophet is authoritative because it isn't the prophet's word, it is God's word, unless we believe it's half and half. And then it's back to my, my authority again. So that's the issue at stake when we evaluate Ellen White. We don't have the luxury of treating her like you treat you and uh, your pastor or me. All right, now with that in mind, let's see what Ellen White says. All of these statements are from Ellen White. We will evaluate her own writings. Go with me to the third paragraph on the first page, Call Porter Ministry, page 125. Sister White, she's talking about herself in the third person, is not the originator of these books. They contain the instruction that during her life work God has been giving her. They contain the precious comforting light that God has graciously given his servant to be given to the world. Okay, that's what she says about her books. Great Controversy, Desire of Ages, etc. The next one. I do not write one article in the paper expressing merely my own ideas. They are what God has opened before me in vision, the precious rays of light shining from the throne. These are articles in our papers, Review and Herald, Signs of the Times, Youth Instructor, which don't have any more, and many other papers. Weak and trembling, I arose at 3 o'clock in the morning to write to you. God was speaking through clay. You might say that this communication was only a letter. Yes, it was a letter, but prompted by the Spirit of God to bring before your mind things that had been shown me. In these letters which I write, in the testimonies I bear, I am presenting to you that which the Lord has presented to me. So there are three categories now. Books, articles, and personal letters. And did you notice she says the same thing about each one of them? She didn't come up with them. This is mess a message from the Lord. So her claim, keep that in mind. Her claim is that she does not originate her writings. They are not done like I write. I write based on research and thinking and study. She does not write based on research, thinking, and study. She writes based on what the Lord revealed to her that she needed to say. Now she has to put the words, put the thoughts in human words. That is her job. But she's not originating those words, she says, or those concepts. She is only putting them into human words and form. The next paragraph. God is either teaching his church, reproving their wrongs, and strengthening their faith, or he is not. This work is of God, or it is not. God does nothing in partnership with Satan. 
my work for the past 30 years bears the stamp of God or the stamp of the enemy. There is no halfway work in the matter. The testimonies are of the Spirit of God or of the devil. And friends, that's the only way a prophet can be evaluated. A prophet can never be half and half. It's either going to be from God or Satan is going to be the originator or the human mind will originate. One of those options. And by the way, that's why in the very early days of Ellen White's ministry, some interesting things happened when she got a vision. They didn't happen that way in the later years of her ministry because by that time her work was established. But in the early years of her ministry, in a meeting just like this, where we would be gathered together and maybe James White or one of the pioneers would be giving a message. In the middle of that, all of a sudden, Ellen White sitting on the platform would be laying on the, on the, on the floor. And all of a sudden, she would be unconscious as to what was going on. And maybe five minutes would pass, maybe 20 minutes, maybe half an hour, sometimes an hour or more. And she would come back from that experience and share what the Lord had been revealing to her during the time that Everyone else didn't know what was going on. This happened quite a bit. Now, the people back then were as skeptical as you and I would have been. What is going on here? Is this something that a uh, trick is being played? Is Satan involved here? And people would actually do things which were not very polite. But they were skeptical and they wanted to be sure. And in the middle of this whole thing, people would walk up to Ellen White when she was either sitting or lying on the floor and they would pinch her nose shut and hold their hand over her mouth so, so she couldn't breathe and there would be no way that she could possibly get a, get a breath of air into her lungs. And they became absolutely convinced that something supernatural was going on here. This was no trick. This was no magic parlor trick. Uh, you've probably heard the story of the Bible, right? That big, heavy Bible that she would hold in her hand outstretched and strong people have tried to hold it and they can manage it for about five minutes she would stand there holding it with for 30 minutes more at a time and here's the interesting part she would get this Bible and she would hold it up and she would say now the Lord in vision the angel just told me what verses are important for us to understand today and while she was doing that she would be turning the pages up here to the verses that she said were the, the verses the Lord had revealed to her and again the skeptics out there like you and me they got ladders <laughs> and they got ladders up to see what well, Ellen White pointing to when she said this verse and that verse and the other verse and they found exact that she was pointing to exactly what she was talking about in vision and she was quoting it without reading it and uh, and, uh, and it was all authentic things like that happened a lot back in those early years for one reason and one reason only because you see there are three options from God from Satan or a human trick and that ruled out the human trickery. There was no possibility that there was some magic parlor trick being played. It left only two options, God or Satan. The supernatural does not prove that God is doing it. It proves that God or Satan is doing it. And that's why I'm very, very grateful that Ellen White is as honest as she was in this last sentence. It's either from God or it's from Satan. You decide. That's what she's telling us. It's not halfway, it's one or the other, from God or from the devil. And that's what we have to decide. Okay, the next paragraph is the most important one we will read this afternoon. So read it very carefully with me. Many times in my experience, I have been called upon to meet the attitude of a certain class who acknowledged that the testimonies were from God but took the position that this matter and that matter were Sister White's opinion and judgment. This suits those who do not love reproof and correction and who, if their ideas are crossed, have occasion to explain the difference between the human and the divine. If the preconceived opinions or particular ideas of some are crossed in being reproved by testimonies, they have a burden at once to make plain their position to discriminate between the testimonies, defining what is Sister White's human judgment and what is the word of the Lord. Everything that sustains their cherished ideas is divine, 
and the testimonies to correct their errors are human, Sister White's opinions. And then la the last sentence, they make of none effect the counsel of God by their tradition. Okay. When I was teaching at Pacific Union College, one of my colleagues was named Desmond Ford. Some of you remember those days. And uh, Desmond Ford believed in the spirit of prophecy. Desmond Ford was not a liberal. He was an evangelical, which means he took a certain view of how salvation works. Desmond Ford could quote the spirit of prophecy far better than I've ever been able to quote it from memory. He could quote the Bible from memory. A brilliant, brilliant man. And as I say, he believed in Ellen White as a prophet of God, except for one little hitch. He said that when Ellen White came to write the book Great Controversy, and she was writing the chapter about Jesus moving from one part of the heavenly sanctuary ministry to the other part of the heavenly sanctuary ministry, the most holy place, in 1844. God never showed that to Ellen White. That was not part of what God revealed to her. That came from the people around her who believed that and were trying to save face because of the Millerite disappointment in 1844, and they pressured her to put that section in the book Great Controversy. That's why we have it in the book. In other words, Desmond Ford was saying, I believe in Ellen White. I believe that she, was, she received visions from God, but not all the time. In some places, she wrote her own ideas or other people's ideas down and palmed them off as from God. Does that describe what we have just read in this paragraph? Making a difference between the human and the divine? Does that explain, does that describe exactly what our scholarly friends have been doing with the four Gospels? Parts of the Gospels accepted, parts of the Gospels you set aside. What agrees with my viewpoints? What doesn't agree with my viewpoints? Final authority? My mind. My mind. And um, so this, uh, during that time, um, following Desmond Ford, there were groups that followed him. And some of those groups began to go interesting directions. Some of them began to shed some of the standards of the church. Some of the, you know, the, the uh, health issues of the church. Get rid of those legalistic requirements. The gospel is about grace and it's about love. And one by one those groups began to uh, kind of drop the Sabbath out of their reckoning as well. A number of groups formed during those years after Desmond Ford. And I'm talking about the years 1970. Uh, 5 to 1985 in that particular period of time. In some of those cases, some individuals had major book burning ceremonies in their backyards. Can you guess what books? These legalistic writings of Ellen White. And they burned the books so they could be free in the Lord, free to do what they wanted to do, meaning. And so, um, those were some difficult days. Another book came out during those years called The White Lie by a former minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Walter Ray. He claimed that when Ellen White wrote things down, she really didn't get them from the Lord. She got them from other books and pretended they were visions from the Lord. She lied to us. The White Lie. That's not what this passage here is talking about. This, book, this passage we just read is not talking about book burnings. It's not talking about throwing away the spirit of prophecy. It's not talking about rejecting. It's talking about, and this is the key point, I believe, but. I believe, except. I believe in Ellen White's writings to a certain degree. But on certain issues, it was her own opinion, and I don't have to worry about it. She's not my authority. Exactly in the same way that the people of Jeremiah's time would say, he's not my authority, he's talking treason. There really is no difference. It's just a difference in time period. We've always had that problem with prophets, haven't we? We don't like our toes being stepped on. Now I thought 
I thought I could probably identify pretty quickly who uh, I'd be talking to that uh, would share these ideas. But I found in the last 10 to 15 years a very interesting phenomenon. As I go to churches like this, and we've been doing this a while, as I go to churches like this, I talk basically to fairly solid, conservative Seventh-day Adventists who hold high standards, who are trying to be faithful to God's Word, who are not trying to throw off and do everything crazy under the sun. I talk to good Adventists as I go around the country. And I found a very, very fascinating and disturbing thing. Some of the Adventists that I talk to are very frustrated about why Jesus hasn't come yet and what has to happen before Jesus can come. And some new ideas have been coming into play about what is the magic key that will turn the, turn the door open to the second coming of Christ. What do we need to do and believe in that we haven't believed in up to this point? And one group, and I'll just share one, I have several uh, experiences that I could share, but one group has come to the opinion that if you believe there are three beings in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are believing a Catholic doctrine called the Trinity. And if you continue to believe that there are three beings known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you will receive the mark of the beast. You cannot receive the seal of God because you are following a false Catholic teaching. These are good Seventh-day Adventists who are teaching and believing this right now. Very faithful Adventists. And I found one very fascinating thing. Aside from the fact that we can do a Bible study on the three beings, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and by the way, there's one other aspect, that when we're talking about the Son, for instance, first of all, the Holy Spirit doesn't exist. The Holy Spirit is a force, a power. When we're talking about the Son, Jesus Christ, the, He had a beginning in time. He was actually a literal Son of God way back in prehistory. He did not exist with the Father from all eternity. Only the Father is eternal. Jesus derived His Godness from His Father and received and became uh, the Son of God by actual generation, they call it. Okay, that's what they believe. And I found a fascinating thing, apart from doing a Bible study, and we, that's the important thing to do as a Bible study. When I share with them some statements from Ellen White, just from Ellen White, like, in Christ was life, original, unborrowed, underived, or Christ was with the Father from all eternity, or there never was a time when Christ was not in close fellowship with the Father. Statements like that, and there are quite a lot of statements like that in the writings of Ellen White. When I share statements like that, I get an interesting response from some of my good, faithful Seventh-day Adventist friends. Well, not everything that Ellen White wrote was really from God. Some of it was her own opinion. Or another one. When Ellen White was writing in the early years, you can trust her writings up till about 1884. And then some very interesting things began to happen. People began to insert material into her writings that were actually published in her books as hers. And she couldn't tell the difference. She published the whole thing. So the later books can't be trusted because they have been manipulated. They have been changed. They have been altered. You can't go by our current versions today of great controversy because that has been so totally altered. You have to go back to the 1884 edition as the only true version of the great controversy. That's one response I get. So I'm just saying that when something is presented that crosses, that's the word that we just read here, that crosses their ideas, they have a burden at once to explain the difference between the human and the divine. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is I'm finding this among conservative Adventists just as much as quote-unquote liberal Adventists right now. That Ellen White's writings have to be taken with a grain of salt. You really can't trust everything she says. She is not the final word. She is a lesser category of prophet. Not like Jeremiah, not like Paul, not like Moses, but one which can make mistakes, can insert her own opinions, 
can write things which are not true. And please notice that last sentence one more time. They make of none effect the counsel of God by their tradition. Have the scholars made the Bible of none effect? You see, the Bible, yes, they say, I believe the Bible. I believe it's the Word of God, but not Genesis 1 to 6. I believe, but they make of none effect. Because how do you know which part to trust? Which part is your authority? It's all a matter of guessing. And you don't know which way you're going. And so in Ellen White, if Ellen White is writing sometimes for the Lord and sometimes out of her own opinion, then you don't know which way, which to trust and which not to trust, particularly, and this is where it really becomes an issue, when it comes to standards, health reform, lifestyle, and things like that, in which we can say, but that was just her own opinion. That doesn't hold any weight with me. I, can't, I don't need to follow that. What authority do her writings have? And by the way, Ellen White did say in another statement, which is not here, she said, the last deception of Satan, the very last deception, is to make of none effect the spirit of prophecy. Not to deny it. Not to burn it. But I believe, except. That's the last deception, she says, of Satan. All right, let's go on. Do not, by your criticisms, take out all the force, all the point and power from the testimonies. Do not feel that you can dissect them to suit your own ideas, claiming that God has given you ability to discern what is light from heaven and what is the expression of mere human wisdom. If the testimonies, and the word testimonies here means all of her writings, if the testimonies speak not according to the word of God, reject them. Christ and Belial cannot be united. She's so really laying it on the line with us. Don't play with my writings, is what she's saying. You accept them or you reject them. Isn't that what we do with Joseph Smith? Do you believe that some things that he wrote are good for us and we need to study a fair amount of it? I don't. Because I reject his pre his, of the presupposition that he wrote under inspiration. And therefore I will not spend any time with someone who claims to be inspired and in fact is not. Because I know that's not coming from the Lord. If the testimonies speak not according to the word of God, reject them. All right. Now, a prophet has a tough job. I am so glad I'm not called to be a prophet. A prophet has two jobs, neither of which I, I want any part of. First job. A prophet has to say whatever God says, no matter how many people get mad. Important people. How would you like to have been Nathan when your assignment was to go talk to that king over there who has spent a year in adultery and murder and tell him what a rotten guy he is? And remember, there were no um, um, Supreme Court uh, appeals during those times if a king didn't like what you said. How would you like to have been Jeremiah? How would you like to have been John the Baptist? Walking into the court of Herod and telling him what the Lord thought of that marriage of his. And his head was handed to him on a platter. He didn't escape. So that's the first job of a prophet. The second job of a prophet, we're going to read it. Last paragraph on the first page. In the testimony sent to Battle Creek, I have given you the light God has given to me. In no case, in no case have I given my own judgment or opinion. I have enough to write of what has been shown me without falling back on my own opinions. Second page. Let's go to the second paragraph on the second page. I have no light on the subject as to just who would constitute the 144,000. Please tell my brethren that I have nothing presented before me regarding the circumstances concerning which they write, and I can set before them only that which has been presented to me. Another situation. A gentleman came to her when she was retired out in Elmshaven in California, clear across from Iowa or somewhere in the Midwest, I'm not sure exactly where. His question was very simple. What does the Lord want me to do with the rest of my life? Look at the answer she gave this man. I am not at liberty to write to our brethren concerning your future work. I have received no instruction regarding the place where you should locate. 
If the Lord gives me definite instruction concerning you, I will give it you. But I cannot take upon myself responsibilities that the Lord does not give me to bear. Wasn't that rude? This man comes all the way across country, not flying by any means, probably on a train. He comes to ask Ellen White what he should do with the rest of his life, and that's what he gets from the prophet? Couldn't she at least have told him, well, maybe this is what you ought to do. I think you're capable. You could try this. Couldn't she have told him that? Now, your pastor could have told her that, or I could have told her that, but could a prophet tell her that, to tell this man that? What would this man have taken that word from Ellen White to be? God's word. He did not come all the way to California to learn what Ellen White wanted, what she thought. He came because he wanted a Urim and a Thummim. Remember what those were? You ask the Lord yes or no and you get an answer. I'd love one of those today. But he wanted a word from the Lord. He did not want Ellen White's word. And if Ellen White had said anything, he would have taken it as a word from the Lord. And since the Lord had not said anything to Ellen White, this is what she has to tell him. This is the only thing she says she can tell him. I cannot take upon myself responsibilities the Lord does not give me to bear. So the second job of a prophet, when speaking in counsel to individuals or to churches, the prophet can say only what God has told the prophet to say. Not one sentence more. No opinions allowed. No suggestions allowed. Only what God has said. Keep your mouth shut if the Lord has not spoken. Boy, that's a tough thing for a prophet. Keep your mouth shut if the Lord has not spoken. I have an interesting little thing here, not in your outline, but I thought you might be interested. She said, I find myself frequently placed where, where I dare give neither assent nor dissent to propositions that are submitted to me, for there is danger that any words I may speak shall be re reported as something that the Lord has given me. It is not always safe for me to express my own judgment, for sometimes when someone wishes to carry out his own purpose, he will regard any favorable word I may speak as special light from the Lord. I shall be cautious in all my movements. Boy, a prophet has to be careful. Say what God says, no matter who you, who you rub wrong. Shut up when the Lord has not spoken. Say nothing, even if you have an opinion. I'm glad I'm not a prophet. All right, let's go now down to page 2, section 2, danger of rejection. It does not become anyone to work, drop a word of doubt here and there that shall work like poison in other minds, shaking their confidence in the messages which God has given, which have aided in laying the foundation of this work and have attended it to the present day in reproofs, warnings, corrections, and encouragements. To all who have stood in the way of the testimonies, I would say, meaning blocking the testimonies, God has given a message to his people and his voice will be heard whether you hear or forbear. Your opposition has not injured me, but you must give an account to the God of heaven who has sent these warnings and instructions to keep his people in the right way. You will have to answer to him for your blindness, for being a stumbling block in the way of sinners. What she is saying there is, I'm not your judge. God is your judge, and you will have to answer to him about your acceptance or rejection. The next one. The next one is the second most important paragraph we will read today. I saw the state of some who stood on present truth, that means believing present truth, but disregarded the visions, the way God had chosen to teach in some cases those who erred from Bible truth. I saw that in striking against the visions, they did not strike against the worm, the feeble instrument that God spake through, but against the Holy Ghost. I saw it was a small thing to speak against the instrument, but it was dangerous to slight the words of God. Right here, let's look at this very carefully. Listen to what I'm going to say next. I really do not care about Ellen White. Hmm, I did to get your attention, didn't I? I really do not care about Ellen White. Because if God's will had been done in the Seventh-day Adventist church as he wanted to do it, the name Ellen White would never be expressed this afternoon. Not even once. It would not come up. Who was God's first choice? I'm going to test your Adventist history. 
Who was God's first choice as a prophetic voice to lead God's people through to the close of probation? That's right. William Foy, a mixed race pastor that was of another church, preaching in his church, and all of a sudden he got visions. And he began to share these visions. We don't know too much about him, unfortunately, because he didn't keep on giving the visions for some reason that he never said and others never described about him. Our history of him is very limited. But he just stopped giving the visions and went back to being a pastor in his local church. And that's the last we hear about William Foy. So, God tried again. Because, listen, you know, this whole issue of getting a people ready for the second coming of Christ and doing a work like no other movement has ever done before and being the only movement that will succeed in its mission in the whole history of human earth demands some help. So God tried again. Second choice. Who was it? That was the first one. Mixed race. The second choice. Who is the second choice to be a prophet to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The name is very similar. Nobody remember? You lost all that, that little grade school education that was somewhere along the line, that book you read somewhere. His name was Hazen Foss. William Foy, Hazen Foss. Now I'll tell you a little story about Hazen Foss. Hazen Foss was a young Millerite preacher, very bright, very brilliant, and he had all the potential in the world to do a great work for the Lord. Hazen Foss got his vision before the Great Disappointment, October 22, 1844. He got his first vision about a pathway leading to heaven and three steps, three platforms of truth that would have to be presented before Jesus would come again. Now this happened to be just a little while before they were expecting Jesus to come in the clouds of heaven. Just a short time before that. And Hazen Foss couldn't for sort this out. You mean there are three more things that have to be developed in the period of time before Jesus is going to come on October 22, 1844? There isn't enough time for that. There are not three, uh, there's not enough time for three more major developments of truth. Of course, we understand them as the three angels' messages. First was the... The, the message of the judgment hour, then come out of Babylon, and then the mark of the beast and the seal of God. And Hazen Foss says, that's impossible. That can't happen. It's not going to be that way. And so he didn't give the visions at all. He was warned, give the visions. And again, he had a problem, because remember one little thing right now. To claim to be a prophet right about the year 1844 was an extremely dangerous proposition because that was the year that Joseph Smith was killed by an irate group of people who said, we want nothing to do with this guy. To claim to be a prophet, you put your head in your hands. It was not a popular claim to make. And so Hazen Foss was afraid of that as well. And so he would not give the messages. A long time, not a long time, but a year or so later, Ellen White was giving the messages that God had given to her in a public meeting just like this. And unknown to her, Hazen Foss was in a back room hearing everything she was saying. After the meeting, Hazen came to Ellen White and he said, Those are exactly the visions that God gave to me. I refuse to give them. The Holy Spirit has departed from me. I have no more interest in religious things at all. I am a lost man. Give the visions, Ellen. For the sake of your own eternal life, give the visions. That was Hazen Foss's testimony to Ellen White. So the second choice did not work out. And so God came, and you've just got to understand now, God came the third time, not to a preacher, not to a bright young Millerite speaker, but he came to a woman. Remember the days in which we are talking about. He came to a woman, and not just a woman, but a woman 
a woman with a third grade education and almost dead for the first part of her life after she got hit in the head with a rock. She was not expected to survive those early years. And a lot of her life was in poor health. So God came to the weakest of the weak, my friends. He really, really did. And he asked her if she would take up the work that two stronger men refused to take up. Could Ellen White have said no to the Lord? Sure she could. Would he have quit? He would have found someone else that we don't even know the name of today. And we would be talking about that person today. You begin to see why I said I really don't care about Ellen White? The issue isn't Ellen White at all. The issue is, is the Holy Spirit speaking through a voice today that is our authority? That's the issue. I remember my teacher uh, one occasion was asked the question by one of us bright young students, how old was Ellen White when she wrote that? Meaning she was pretty young. Did she have any understanding of these things? And this teacher of mine, British gentleman, scratched his beard a little bit, thought about it, and he said, how old was the Holy Spirit right then? <laughs> and that's the only issue that matters, isn't it? The Holy Spirit is the only one we, res we are responsible to in authority. Not even a prophet, but a prophet speaks for the Holy Spirit. And that's why she wrote this, that it's a small thing to speak against the instrument. Ellen White didn't get everything right. Sometimes she didn't do the very best. She was fallible just like all of us. She made mistakes. All prophets make mistakes. But a prophet cannot transmit mistakes in his or her words or else we don't have any authority. There's a difference between a prophet making a mistake. Like Nathan told David, go ahead and build the temple. And as soon as he got out, God kicked him right back in and said, I didn't tell you to say that. You tell him what I tell you. So a prophet can make mistakes, but a prophet cannot write those or speak those and continue to be a prophet or else he ends up like Balaam. God does not speak through a voice which is not faithful. Now, I didn't finish this whole paragraph. Let's go back now. I saw it was a small thing to speak against the instrument, but it was dangerous to slight the words of God. I saw if they were in error, and God chose to show them their errors through visions. And they disregarded the teachings of God through visions. They would be left to take their own way and run in the way of error and think they were right until they would find it out too late. If there is ever one sentence I have read in all of Ellen White's writings that describe more accurately the last 50 years in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I don't know what it is. I'm going to give you just a couple quick examples we could spend all afternoon on this subject. Medical missionary work. Did Ellen White say that that was the opening wedge, the right hand of the gospel, everything that would open doors to, to the great cities, to uh, things that are needing to be done for evangelism? How are we doing on medical missionary work today? Uh, the visions that Ellen White was given went something like this. In every reasonably sized town, there should be a clinic where a doctor and a minister would work together on the same salary to, to win souls and share the health message. How are we doing, folks? How are we doing? Not even close. We have gone a completely different direction. Sanitariums, they don't work anymore, where people come from for a month or two to try to figure out what's wrong with their health and get themselves straightened out. No, we've got to go the acute care hospital method. That's the only way that works today, and it has to be half-funded by the government. Medical missionary work? But education, that's one area I've spent a share of my life in. And uh, I, can't, uh, just, I can't tell you what it was like as I was teaching at the collegiate level and I came across a little book by Sutherland, Principles of Christian Education. I read that book and I said, am I doing education even slightly? I'm going to classes, I'm giving grades, I'm, teaching lec I'm giving lectures, and I read this. Principles of Christian Education by E.A. Sutherland. If that's right, I'm not doing any educating at all. 
I'm doing something else than Christian education. That bothered me a lot, let me tell you, because I was working on my Ph.D. and all the rest during that time. I was going down the route which every teacher must go down to re retain credentials as a collegiate level teacher. And I read that. Let me give you a little bit of a, a nutshell history here. Sutherland was teaching at Walla Walla. That's where he first uh, was, began his, uh, what we know of him as teaching. Ellen White at that time was over in Australia. The brethren had kind of pushed her over there. We're getting nervous with you at Battle Creek is essentially what they said. So she said, I will take this little exile of yours and I will use it for God's honor and glory. We will start a school in Australia where you can't put your fingers in the pie very much from Battle Creek. And this school will be after the visions that God has given me on how to do Christian education. And Avondale College was started on the basis of that. Well, over in the United States, Sutherland was hearing these things. And he said, we need to do that at Walla Walla. So he started out with some of the principles that he had been hearing from Ellen White in Australia. And then the brethren in Battle Creek started to take notice of this, the leaders of the church. And they said, no, you shouldn't be doing this at Walla Walla. You need to do it right here in Battle Creek. You need to do it at the heart of the work. Let's have this reform in education. Let's get it right. Let's do education properly right here in Battle Creek. And Sutherland said to them, I can't do it in Battle Creek. Battle Creek is in the middle of a city. We don't have any room for agriculture. We don't have any room for industry. We can't do it in the middle of a city, according to the principles that God has outlined for education. If you'll let me move the whole college, I'll come your way. And so a whole, they took him at his word. They were willing to do it. And a whole trainload moved out of Battle Creek and right down to Berrien Springs, Michigan, where Emmanuel Missionary College was formed. And Sutherland and McGann began to develop the principles of Christian education for about two whole years is all they lasted. Because you see, they were doing some radical things. Education was half work and half book study. And it's just as important as the grades you got in a class was the work that you produced and what you, how you learned how to develop a trade. So you could go out and do something with your life even if you couldn't get a job with the book study you had done. So you could go to the missionary fields and show them how to raise crops and how to build a little small industry. That's the kind of education they were doing. And because of that, grades play, played very little part in this. You did not get a diploma at the end of your college education. You got a certificate saying you had completed what you started out to do. And there was no set number of courses or kinds of courses you took. No GE courses, general ed courses were necessary. You came to the teacher. You told the teacher, this is the kind of thing I want out of my education. The teacher would outline classes in line with your desires. You would take just those classes, and then you would leave having accomplished what you came to the college for. That's radical stuff. No degrees, no diplomas, no uh, grades. And the people at, Battle, at Emmanuel Missionary College said, we can't handle that. And Sutherland and McGann had to resign. Well, they didn't give up because Ellen White kept pushing. By this time, she was back in the United States. And she suggested and they agreed they would take a little trip on a boat south. And they took a trip on a boat down to Tennessee. And around Nashville, Tennessee, in the little town of Madison, they came across around a bend in the river, and Ellen White said, that's the place I saw in vision. And the story that Sutherland tells is as they got out of the boat and looked over the property, he sat on a rock and cried. It was the worst possible place you could ever imagine to start a college. Pig pens, chicken of barns, all broken down, no room for crops, nothing could be developed. It was the worst of the worst. But Sutherland and McGann had such total faith that Ellen White was speaking from the Lord and not her opinion that they said, we'll put our feelings aside, we'll stop crying, and we'll get to work. And Madison became one of the shining beacons of Adventist education for many, many years. 
I mean, to the extent that people, delegations from places that are third world countries would come over to Madison saying, we don't have much money, we don't have any you know, bright minds, we just want to get education started on a small basis in our country. How do you do it? Teach us how. And a lot of people came over and learned how education could work on, in, a, in a simple way. Trouble was, by that time, all of our major colleges had been established. Walla Walla, PUC, uh, you know, uh, Columbia, etc., etc., all around the country, Southern. And uh, this place, Madison, that was not a denominational school. That was a self-supporting school. And in those days, that meant you support yourselves. We don't help you any. Self-supporting meant you're on your own, brothers. You, 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 you can take your little li uh, life boy with you and sink or swim. That's up to you. You are on your own. And so uh, Madison didn't get any help. Madison was always just kind of the other school. And, uh, the, other, and the major schools went a different direction in terms of education. As you probably know, there isn't any Madison College anymore. It died. It's gone. It doesn't exist. And here's my simple point, the reason for this long story. As best I can tell, Avondale, coming through Emmanuel Missionary College for those two years, down to Madison, was to be the model of all Adventist education right up until the second coming of Christ. All Adventist schools were to have been patterned after that Avondale Emmanuel Missionary Madison model. And that's totally gone. And has been gone for as lo way before I was born. I've been born in a different Adventist educational world than Ellen White's understanding of how education could be done. And today, we are just agonizing over the fact that so many of our young people go through our colleges and walk out of the church almost immediately after that. I don't know, there may be families here in that very situation. Everywhere I go, that is the most important question I get is how do I, what do I, where do I educate my children? How do I do it? And we agonize over the fact that we're losing so many of our Adventist young people does that get back to this? They, God would show, show them their errors through visions. They disregard those teachings. They would be left to take their own way and run in the way of error and think they were right until they would find it out too late. Are we running in the way of error, my friends, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? I've just listed two areas. We could talk about quite a few more. And the key point is not to discourage any one of us because this is still the apple of God's eye. This church is still the one he wants to work through to finish his work. But we haven't been faithful to the prophetic voice. We have picked and chosen. We have set her aside. We have ignored what, she, what is she saying. And we wonder why things are going wrong. We wonder why there isn't the unity and the direction and the mission and the focus. This sentence, my friends, is a hugely important sentence for every one of us. Next paragraph. What reserve power has the Lord with which to reach those who have cast aside his warnings and reproofs and have credited the testimonies of the Spirit of God to no higher source than human wisdom? In the judgment, what can you who have done this offer to God as an excuse from turning from the evidences he has given you that God was in the work? All right. Page three. Have you, I know you have, you've realized that sometimes prophets say things which are hard to be mis to understand and which are easy to misunderstand. Did, uh, do a great number of Christians misunderstand what uh, Paul said about law and grace? Can Paul be easily misunderstood on those subjects? Ellen White said on one occasion, I am a lesser light, and to give, uh, to give emphasis to the greater light. Lesser light, greater light. 
What does lesser light connotate as you hear the word lesser? Not as important? Not as bright? Not as clear? Not as authoritative? It's lesser? The Bible is greater? Ellen White's writings are lesser? All right, let's look at that for just a minute now. Let's read these two paragraphs. The written testimonies are not to give new light, but to impress vividly upon the heart the truths of inspiration already revealed. Man's duty to God and to his fellow man has been distinctly specified in God's word, yet but few of you are obedient to the light given. Additional truth is not brought out, but God has through the testimony simplified the great truths already given and in his own chosen way brought them before the people to awaken and impress the mind with them that all may be left without excuse. Okay? No new light, just, a, a just clearer explanations. All right, next paragraph. In ancient times, God spoke to men by the mouth of prophets and apostles. In these days, he speaks to them by the testimonies of his spirit. There was never a time when God instructed his people more earnestly than he instructs them now concerning his will and the course that he would have them pursue. Does that sound like lesser importance? Here is the way the statement reads that people have misunderstood. Little heed is given to the Bible, and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. So what is this business of lesser light? I'm going to illustrate it on the screen. Let's see, get it. There it is. All true light, all true truth comes from God. All that God wants to know for us, for us to know, its source is from God. And so the first thing that God did to try to convey his understanding is to speak to Moses and then Moses had the responsibility of speaking and then writing the material that God had given him. So God speaks to Moses. God could have talked directly to us. He chose not to except for the Ten Commandments. God spoke to Moses. Moses put those ideas in words for us. Now, if God's will had been done through the Israelite people, how big would your Bible have been? Five books. And maybe Job, okay? Five books. The Pentateuch, the Torah, the books of Moses. Because if you read carefully through those books, the whole plan of salvation is there. The lamb, the sacrifices, the, what Jesus will do, the, uh, the, the obedience, disobedience, it's all there. So God speaking through Moses was enough. So why did God speak again? Because they didn't follow Moses very well. So God kept on trying. He didn't quit. He said, let's keep going. So God spoke through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and all of the Old Testament prophets. Now, those prophets had two jobs to do now. They had to convey what God said to them so we could understand it, just like Moses. But now they had to be tested. Were they true or were they false? Because, for instance, when Isaiah was speaking, there was a man by the name of Micaiah. That's not Micah. Micaiah, who was also speaking words from the Lord, he said. And the people had to have some way to figure out who was telling the truth. Is Isaiah or is Micaiah? Because they were saying opposite things. So how was Isaiah tested? By the Bible. Moses was their Bible. For a thousand years, Moses was their Bible. If you would ask a Hebrew in the time of Isaiah, show me your Bible, they would have brought out the books of Moses. That was their Bible. That was their authority. And to pass the test... As a true prophet, Isaiah had to prove that he was in harmony with the Bible. He was tested by the Bible, which then was the writing of Moses. So I ask you a simple question. In terms of Isaiah, when Isaiah is speaking and writing, who is the greater light and who is the lesser light? Moses is the greater light, and Isaiah is the lesser light. Because uh, uh, Isaiah is tested by Moses. Moses is the authority. Isaiah is the present speaker claiming to have authority. And once Isaiah passes the test, he moves into positions of authority, but not until. Well, did that work out very well for the Israelites? 
No, again, once again, they were not obedient to all of the prophets. So God didn't give up. He tried again. He kept on going. This is now New Testament times. He now speaks through Paul and all of the other New Testament writers in the New Testament. They give God's word to us, and now they are tested by not just Moses, but Moses and all the prophets. They didn't speak of Old and New Testament in their time. That's our terms. They spoke of the law, the prophets, and the writings. The law was Moses, the prophets, and the writings are the Psalms. The law, the prophets, and the writings were their, was their Bible. And when Paul came along, didn't he ask the believers to test him out, check him out? They were more noble because they checked him out to see if what he said was true by the Bible. So when Paul is speaking and writing, who's the greater light and who's the lesser light? The Old Testament is the greater light. And Paul is the lesser light during that period of time. Because he's tested by the Old Testament teachings. And so obviously the last part in this little uh, drama that God is playing out, he doesn't quit with Paul. But 2,000 years later he speaks again. And he speaks through Ellen White. And she says she is the lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. So lesser cannot mean lesser in inspiration, lesser in importance, lesser in clarity, or lesser in authority. Can it? It has to do with lesser in scope. The Bible is the scope for all time. Ellen White is the one at the very end of time to help people make it through the time of trouble coming ahead. It's like the old ocean voyages, and it's still done today. The captain is the one who guides the ocean uh, uh, ship, the ship across the ocean. And when they come to a difficult harbor, a pilot comes on board. And until they reach their destination, the pilot directs that ship as to where it should go. Ellen White is like that pilot. During that period of time, just that limited period of time, her scope is lesser, her purpose is lesser, but her authority is the same as John and Paul and Moses. And that's something that I think is one of the great misunderstood statements of Ellen White, that she is the lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. Okay, I'm going to finish up now. We've taken a long time, but this is the most important subject for today. Page 3, Doctrinal Authority. When they, she's talking about the early, early days of Adventists. When they came to the point in their study where they said, We can do nothing more. The Spirit of the Lord would come upon me. I would be taken off in vision. And a clear explanation of the passages we had been studying would be given me, with instruction as to how we were to labor and teach effectively. Thus light was given that helped us to understand the scriptures in regard to Christ, his mission, and his priesthood. A line of truth extending from that time to the time when we shall enter the city of God was made plain to me, and I gave to others the instruction that the Lord had given me. We're going to take a brief look this afternoon at something that you may never have thought of before because I guarantee I never had and I went through all of our classes and schools all the way through in my education and I never heard what I'm going to share with you next until I found it for myself. In the early days, we gathered together to study the Bible. We didn't have our doctrines formed, no 28 statements of belief. We were trying to figure out what the Bible taught. And you know the story about beginning the Sabbath, don't you? Sometimes, some of us began it at 12 o'clock, some of us began it at 6 o'clock, and some of us began it at sundown. We were do all doing different things until finally we came together, studied it out, and decided the Bible taught sundown to sundown. Okay, that's how we did it. We had to go through it step by step. And she's writing about that period of time. Please notice at points they said, we can do nothing more. And then Ellen White would begin to speak. Now I'm not going to take too much time on this. I'm going to go over to page 4 right now. You can read the rest of them on your own uh, at a future time. Page 4, we're going to look at one of these conferences. Our first conference was at Valney in Brother Arnold's barn. There were about 35 present, all that could be collected in that part of the state. There were hardly two agreed. Each was strenuous for his views, declaring that they were according to the Bible. 
Brother Arnold held that the thousand years of Revelation 20 were in the past and that the 144,000 were those raised at Christ's resurrection. And as we had the emblem of our dying Lord before us and was about to commemorate his sufferings, Brother Arnold arose and said he had no faith in what we were about to do, that the sacrament was a continuation of the Passover to be observed but once a year. These strange differences of opinion rolled a heavy weight upon me, especially as Brother Arnold spoke of the thousand years being in the past. I knew that he was in error, and great grief pressed my spirits. The light of heaven rested upon me. I was soon lost to earthly things. My accompanying angel presented before me some of the errors of those present and also the truth in contrast with their errors, that these discordant views which they claimed to be according to the Bible were only according to their opinion of the Bible and that their errors must be yielded and they unite upon the third angel's message. All right, interesting story. You have a group of people gathering together to try to understand what the Bible is really teaching and what we are going to believe. And all of them have different opinions. And here comes Ellen White out of a vision. And she's beginning to give the messages that she has been given. Now there's something here to understand. It's not in your outline, but I'll just share it with you quickly. During this whole time, she says, I could not understand the reasoning of the brethren. My mind was locked, as it were, and I could not comprehend the meaning of the scriptures we were studying. This was one of the greatest sorrows of my life. I was in this condition of mind until all the principal points of our faith were made clear to our minds in harmony with the word of God. The brethren knew that when not in vision, I could not understand these matters, and they accepted as light direct from heaven the revelations given. Here's another statement. For two or three years, my mind continued to be locked to the scriptures. You find those in Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 207, and Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 38. So here we have the brethren studying together, differing opinions. Ellen White comes off, goes, goes off in vision, and she comes back and she says something like, Brother Arnold, you've got to stop teaching what you're teaching your teaching is wrong. What would you do if you were Brother Arnold? Wouldn't you say something like this? Here's what I would say. Ellen, would you give me a Bible study? I've studied this whole thing out on the, on the, uh, the, the thousand years. And I believe, I have evidence to believe that they're in the past. It's all in the past. It's not in the future. Give me a Bible study, Ellen. And you know Ellen White could no more give a Bible study than to do a physics lesson that afternoon. What I just read, that her mind was locked to the meaning of the scriptures, one of the greatest sorrows of her life. She couldn't follow the logic, the evidence of the ones that were talking, discussing these subjects. All she could do is say, Brother Arnold, this is what the angel just told me. And Brother Arnold had a decision to make, didn't he? Wow, that's a tough one. I don't know why I'm wrong. I haven't been shown why I'm wrong, but this young woman, approximately at that point, 21 years of age, no education, this young woman says that I've got to stop teaching what I'm teaching. And I don't think she did it for just Brother Arnold, because she went around that room, I think, 35 people, and they each was strenuous for his views. What would you have done if you were in that room that day. Well, I think I know what happened because of the last sentence in this paragraph. Our meeting ended victoriously. Truth gained the victory. Apparently, Brother Arnold said, I don't know why I'm wrong, but I have enough faith that God has spoken that I'll figure it out later why I'm wrong. I'll stop teaching what I'm teaching. Boy, does that take faith. What that, what? These other references, Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 207, and Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 38, that her mind was locked to the reasoning of the brethren. So we've got something interesting going on here. Look at the next paragraph. At that time, one error after another pressed in upon us. Ministers and doctors brought in new doctrines. We would search the scriptures with much prayer, and the Holy Spirit would bring the truth to our minds. Sometimes whole nights would be devoted to searching the scriptures. 
and earnestly asking God for guidance. Companies of devoted men and women assembled for this purpose. The power of God would come upon me and I was enabled clearly to define what is truth and what is error. As the points of our faith were thus established, our feet were placed upon a solid foundation. We accepted the truth point by point under the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. I would be taken off in vision and explanations would be given me. How did we get our doctrines, my friends? That's the question. How did we formulate the beliefs that we share today as Seventh-day Adventists? How did we come to understand what we today understand? I would love to tell you today it was by Bible study and prayer and fasting. End of discussion. But that's not what happened. In some cases, yes, that's all it needed. But in some cases, the brethren said, we can do nothing more. We're stuck. We can't agree. Ellen White would be taken off in vision. She would come back and notice, she says, I was enabled clearly to define what is truth and what is error. I have been taught that Ellen White's visions only confirmed what had earlier been agreed upon by our Bible study, by these Bible study groups meeting together. She did not initiate. She only confirmed. So I'm going to ask you a question. The words define and confirm, are they two different meanings? When you jump off a third story building, do you define or confirm the law of gravity? <laughs> when Albert Einstein came up with his theory of relativity, was he defining or confirming something? He was defining, wasn't he? Brand new knowledge. No one had ever come up with that theory before. Define means a new initiative. Confirm means it's already been done and I substantiate it. I was taught that Ellen White only confirmed what Bible study had led our pioneers to, but she says, I was in the defining process. I helped to define our doctrines. We did not get our doctrines just from Bible study alone. We got our doctrines from Bible study and from visions. In fact, she says it down a little farther. Uh, Gospel Workers, page 307. The foundations of our faith were laid at the beginning of our work by prayerful study of the Word and by revelation, meaning visions. That's how we got our doctrines. All right. The reason that we have not taught this in the Seventh-day Adventist Church is because I have walked myself into the biggest quicksand you could ever imagine. Because having said what I've now said, what can anyone out there who is questioning Seventh-day Adventism now say? We get our doctrines from Ellen White, not the Bible. Yeah, that's the accusation, which is very, very strong. You get all your doctrines from Ellen White, not from the Bible. And I've just said the same thing right here, except not quite. We did study the Bible. We did try to understand it. We did come to some conclusions, but on some things we couldn't, and the Lord stepped in and said, this is what the Bible teaches, not that. Brother Arnold, you're wrong. The millennium is in the future. From vision, that was a vision given by God when we didn't understand it. And so all of this now puts a major problem in the works. How then are we not a cult? Because that's what a cult is all about. Following a person, not the Word of God. Are we followers of Ellen White? Not the Word of God. All right. Don't let people like Walter Martin define cult for you. Find out what the word really means. I spoke few years ago in a church in Los Angeles called the People's Temple. Anybody remember that? The People's Temple? Remember Jim Jones? Remember Guyana? Isn't that the right country? I think it is. Took his people down there from the People's Temple in Los Angeles. This was to be the great communal experience and then when the authorities began to question irregularities, they sent a congressman down there, and what'd they do? They killed him. And at that point, Jim Jones said, From God's word, I am telling you, which was really my word, 
Drink the poison. That's what our destiny is. That's a cult. When you follow the teachings of a man over the word of God. Jeremiah is not a cult leader because his teachings are based on the word of God. Even though they sound very difficult, surrender to Babylon. But it's still based on the writings of Moses. If you disobey, you will be taken into captivity. Jeremiah is not a cult leader because he agrees with the Word of God. Ellen White is either in contradiction to the Word of God or a true prophet. Those are the only two options. If she's in contradiction to the Word of God and we follow Ellen White, we're a cult. If she's in harmony with the Word of God and we follow her writings, we're following a prophetic voice. It's a delicate issue, but it is a very important issue. And at this point, here is the key, the key understanding that we've got to, got to have. Here is why it's so important to believe that everything that Ellen White said was from God. Not just parts, not just pieces. Because if some of the things weren't from God, then which of our doctrines are made up by her? She did help to form our doctrines. We did not come up with them all by ourselves. And so if she's only partially speaking for God, then which parts of our doctrines are false doctrines? Which one? The health message, for instance? The standards of the church? Or maybe even something as serious as whether a person is in heaven or hell right now, after you, they die? Which parts come from God, and which parts come from Ellen White's own theories? So at this point... This is why it's so important to believe that everything that Ellen White spoke and wrote is from God, not her own opinion. If it's from her own opinion, we're the biggest cult going. If it's from God, we have a prophetic leader, just like they had in Jeremiah's time. It's crucial to understand this subject today if Adventism is going to continue to exist. Look at the very last sentence. Bottom of the page. All who believe that the Lord has spoken through Sister White and has given her a message will be safe from the many delusions that will come in these last days. Which means that all who don't believe, what? We aren't smart enough to withstand what Satan is going to throw at us. How desperately we need that last, what Ellen White warns us about in the book Great Controversy. If you haven't, if you haven't read the last chapters of Great Controversy, read them again. The deceptions of Satan are going to be very, very strong. And you need to know what God has said and how to prepare for them. So right here in this subject that we're dealing with, we have got to understand that survival as a church is only possible through obedience to God's voices, whether they be in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. Now I'm going to add one more thing so there's no misunderstanding. Yes, we did get some of our messages through Ellen White's visions. But today, not one of our evangelists ever has to say, this is from the Bible and this is from Ellen White. Because every one of our doctrines can be proved 100% from the Bible without any need for Ellen White. We just weren't bright enough to get it the first time around. We were just thick-headed like most other people and we got stuck. So God helped us. Once God pointed us to the right places, it's easy to figure out these doctrines from the Bible alone. Our doctrines are not based on Ellen White. They're based on the Bible, but God helped us to find those doctrines in the Bible through Ellen White. I know that makes us a little nervous, but that's the way it was. I'm going to share a story with you as we finish up. Back in the 1950s in Ministry Magazine was this statement. No doctrinal truth or prophetic interpretation ever came to this people through the spirit of prophecy, not in a single case. That was the statement. No doctrinal truth ever came to this people through the spirit of prophecy. M. L. Andreasen, I read from him last night, he came across this statement. Listen to his response. I am charitable enough to believe that the brother who wrote in the ministry did not know any better. But if so, his ignorance was profound. The tendency in the article is to downgrade Mrs. White. It would be more nearly true to say that many of our doctrines, including those of Christ's mission and priesthood, came to us as light direct from heaven 
through the visions. And that's just the way it was. That's how our doctrines came into existence. Do we have complete confidence in that prophetic voice given to us? Or are we just like the people of Jeremiah's time who said we can't stomach some of what he says to us? We're not going to do it that way. The results were tragic for that generation. And we dare not repeat that mistake. We dare not misunderstand how God speaks through prophetic voices. And once again, it's not about Ellen White. It's about the Holy Spirit leading a church and leading us as individuals. Are we willing to let God do it His way? So I have two uh, appeals for you. Number one, make up your mind. Don't sit on the fence forever. It's not comfortable on the fence anyway. Make up your mind. Do all the study you need to. Take all the time you need to. But make up your mind. Number two. And this is the one that is the hardest. If, I, if this church is a normal church, there are going to be a number of families here whose loved ones are not part of God's faithful remnant right now. They're wandering out in the world, doing their own thing, careless, and you're praying for them. You're hoping that they will return to their faith. And these young ones find a miraculous experience. They come back to the church and you praise the Lord. The lost sheep has returned. The lost sheep has been found. We have a feast together in praise for the Lord. Except what if that loved one of yours that you've been praying for comes back to a church where hardly anyone ever talks about Ellen White. Where the pastor may say, there are going to be no quotations from Ellen White from the pulpit, only the Bible. Where the friends in the Sabbath school class, do you really believe in Ellen White? She's way out of date. Her writings don't make any sense anymore. Oh, that's silly to believe in her. If all the people are casting doubt around your loved one as to the ministry of Ellen White, your loved one is in way more danger now than when they are out carousing in the bars. Because your loved one is now feeling secure back in the fold. But in a fold where everything that is preparing a person for the soon coming of Christ is being laughed at and rejected and scorned and mocked. You'd better be praying twice as hard for your loved one if your loved one is in that situation. Because that is the situation, unfortunately, tragically, in a number of Seventh-day Adventist circles today, where Ellen White is ridiculed at the highest levels. Those are issues that we have to come to grips with. Those are issues we have to be praying about for ourselves, for our loved ones, for our friends. Faith in God's prophetic voice is never an easy thing. It always seems like it has prickles with it. Some things that are said that we don't like, that don't make sense to us, that we don't want to go by, and we find reasons for going another direction. I hope that this study has helped a little bit in trying to formulate your thoughts on this very, remember I said this is the most important subject I talk about. And I'll add just one last little thing for those of you who are uh, trying to uh, meet certain oppositions. There are a lot of websites right now that are very, very negative about the writings of Ellen White. And I'm going to give you a couple of sources by which, if you do run into this problem, that you can uh, do some research on your own to try to meet some of these issues. A couple of websites that I have come across that you can go to. The first one is an official website by the denomination. It's called ellenwhiteanswers.org. Meeting some of the issues that are being raised about Ellen White today. ellenwhiteanswers.org. Another one is done by an individual layperson in the Adventist church down in Tennessee. A friend of mine has done a great job with his website. You have to follow this one carefully to get it right. Ellen-White.com. If you just put in Ellen White, it goes to the general conference. Ellen white dash. I'm sorry, Ellen-White.com. Got it? Ellen-White.com is another website. Um, another book that has just been put out 
is called 101 Questions About Ellen White and Her Writings. 101 Questions About Ellen White and Her Writings available from the ABCs. So those are some sources. If you do run into objections, problems that you have no idea what the proper answer is for, that you might find some help right there. All right, I've taken a long time on this because, as I say, this is the most important subject I talk about in everything I say because it has to do with who is the final authority, my mind or the voice of the prophetic, the, the prophetic voice. Where does final authority lie?